skilled craftspeople, project managers, and so on. And they all work together in an interdisciplinary way. They come from the global north, global south, all over the world. Ecomos UK is a national committee, and we are based in London and made up of 470 members. This event has been organized by our emerging professionals in collaboration with their counterparts in Portugal. We have eight scientific committees of our own in the UK. We encourage the involvement of emerging professionals as part of succession planning, as well as ensuring that the younger generations are actively involved in protecting and shaping heritage for the future, and thereby ensure its sustainability and relevance for future generations. A key objective of ECOMOS UK is to connect and share and exchange knowledge, skills and experiences with our international ECOMOS colleagues in peacetimes and during reconstruction following armed conflicts and natural disasters. The focus is on the tangible, on tangible elements, buildings, monuments, collections and sites, as much as documenting and reconstructing memories and stories attached to the tangible elements and customs and traditions, including craft skills. We are guided by individual national committees calls for urgent and long-term support. We work, at, we work alongside them in, in, in the affected countries and regions. The work is usually coordinated by Comos International, the sec Secretariat based in Paris, not, but not always. We have individual national committees have contacts with each other. At this point, I'd like to congratulate colleagues at Comos Syria who have set up the first national committee and we look forward to working with them. This event is therefore timely, especially in the context of the Ukraine war and the very recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria, which has already been debilitated by war and other developments which have resulted in the destruction of heritage across the globe. Defining heritage and identity in peacetime is complex and problematic. It becomes even more challenging when reconstructing heritage identity, post-war or natural disasters, especially if conflicting views of the past history and evolving national identity, state building and ownership of cultural pro properties had played a role in fueling the wars in the first place. I look forward to the presentation from the three speakers who will set out their personal views on this subject over the next hour. I also look forward to a lively debate and I hope you will contribute to it as much as the speakers. Finally, I'd like to thank Noor, Mohammed, and Brandy for organizing this event. Thank you, and let's have a, a good evening. Thank you very much, Clara. We'll have our, our next speaker, Dr. Ata Asaloum. She's a lecturer in the Architecture and Urban Heritage at the University of Liverpool School of Architecture, and she has been so since 2017. Uh, she's an architect and has previously worked in private sector, uh, sorry, private practice in Syria. Uh, her research is related to both uh, bottom up and, uh, sorry, top, bot top down and bottom up heritage management approaches and includes intangible heritage elements and cultural heritage assets. We'll now have Dr. Ata Asaloum. Thank you so much, Noor, for this uh, nice introduction, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, I will share my screen. Yeah, is it clear now? Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, so as Noor said, uh, I am a lecturer at the Liverpool School of Architecture. I am also currently directing uh, an MA in Sustainable Heritage Management, and I am also an ECOMOS trustee, ECOMOS UK trustee. So uh, the purpose of uh, my presentation today really is to explore the procedures and criteria used for heritage designation, particularly in relation to the word heritage list. Uh, to, illust to illustrate my arguments, I will examine two World Heritage Sites, Liverpool, which recently lost its status, and Old Damascus, which is currently on the endangered list. Uh, my primary focus will be on uh, the role of uh, heritage in shaping identity. I would like to clarify that the views presented in this work are solely my own 
and don't reflect the opinions of ECOMAS UK or the University of Liverpool. I also wish to acknowledge that certain uh, portions of the work presented here have been derived from multiple research projects uh, conducted in partnership between myself and various researchers, including Jamie Hall, Lewis Washington and Amir al -Zaybak. So, designation. Heritage designation involves formally identifying and legally protecting a diverse range of heritage assets. However, this process has become increasingly complicated on both theoretical and strategic levels due to the augmentation of the approach, type of heritage varying from tangible to intangible, number of heritage properties on the list already, stakeholders and values involved. Besides the complexity in the implementation of heritage planning policies. Managing threats to designated assets is a more significant challenge than simply safeguarding the main values. Of course, I mean here outstanding universal value, authenticity and integrity, which are associated with World Heritage Listing. This is because it also involves preserving the identity and visual integrity, as well as intangible values. According to the UNESCO, armed conflicts and war, earthquakes and other natural disasters, uncontrolled urbanization and unchecked tourist development pose more major problems toward heritage sites. UNESCO also stated that Inscribing a site on the list of World Heritage in Danger allows the World Heritage Committee to allocate immediate assistance from the World Heritage Fund to the endangered property. So this is a list of um, key World Heritage sites in danger, of course, in the world. So why Liverpool and Damascus? All Damascus and Liverpool located in the least developed East and well-developed West, respectively, share the privilege of being World Heritage Sites. However, both have been moved to the endangered list due to threats to their significances, with Liverpool unfortunately now being permanently delisted. I will briefly, of course, within this 20 minutes, examine specific heritage policies and other primary and secondary data to question possibilities to preserve the unique identities of the two sites. So I looked at heritage policy documents issued between 2000 and 2021, including the operational guidelines for the implementation of Ford Heritage Convention. I found that only three documents in this group provided useful definition of identity value. The 2000 ECOMOS Poland Charter of CARCO stated that identity refers to both present and past values within the sphere of the community. The 2005 UNESCO Vienna Memorandum noted that identity includes townscape, roofscapes, main visual access. Also, and finally, ECOMOS uh, the 2010 ECOMOS New Zealand Charter noted the importance of the connection between local population and the site in terms of whose identity the sites reflect. And then it also detailed that identity values relate to the emotional ties of society to specific objects or site, of course, including age, tradition, continuity, and so on. I would like to note that Liverpool was listed uh, in 2004 and then inscribed on the list of World Heritage in Danger in 2012 and finally delisted in 2021. I'm not going to go through details of decisions, plans, etc., but I will look at two areas. The first is within the previous World Heritage site and the second is outside previous sites. But of course, it included a significant historical structure. So the first area is the urban intervention within the Man Island. If we look at the setting, Man, Man Island was an area of land between the Canning Dock and Pierhead in Liverpool. 
The developments have changed up the dynamic of the site quite significantly, providing highly contrasting buildings within a historical landscape. As we can see here, the three graces illustrate neoclassical features with delicate ornaments, small windows of varied design and placement. The Man Island development is in high contrast to the form and design of the three graces. The views towards the pier head from the Albert docks demonstrated an area of historic significance. However, now it's clearly interrupted by the Man Island developments. In terms of social value, Historically, the area was full of activities as the site was a transport point for locals on daily basis, as well as for international exchange. The attempt of introducing the glass atrium for a visual and actual connection has not been a success from my point of view. The second area is Liverpool Lime Street. In line, of course, with the city-wide development tendency, 51 to 77 Lime Street was demolished in 2016, which included 10 terraced buildings dating from the 18th to the 20th century. The most noteworthy of this was the Art Deco-styled futurist picture house, the cinema. The setting of these structures contributed to its significance and distinctive character. As we can see, the new settings could be in any city in Europe. It's also clear that the new townscape doesn't contribute to the character of that area, as it replaced the structures with distinctive character with repetitive facade. As we can see, the different historical layers previously contributed to to the street identity. In terms of views and vistas and social values, it's clear that tradition, continuity, memorial, and symbolic values are not clearly represented. Moving now to Old Damascus as a post-war World Heritage Site. Damascus was established in the third millennium BC and it's considered one of the oldest cities in the Middle East. It was listed on the World Heritage List in 1979 and then moved to the Endangered List in 2013. The original listing was according to five criteria. Of course, because of the armed conflict, many buildings have been damaged. Luckily, Old Damascus is the least damaged World Heritage Site in Syria. I'm going to look at one of the damaged bazaars. This area was damaged by a fire in 2016 and currently under reconstruction. This bazaar or souk is part of the daily life of Old Damascus. The tight network of traditional streets are joined by distinctive architectural monuments and the souk itself is home to significant buildings. Unfortunately, the souk was badly damaged by, by the fire, as we can see, and then it's currently undergoing reconstruction. However, using new material and with no clear guidance. Although numerous heritage policies have been issued internationally, there is still a lack of clear guidance on how to assess architectural intervention in the context of heritage after armed conflict or after disaster. The risk is all shops will be built in a unified character with no actual involvement by the shop owners or with no reflection on what was before. As we can see also, the souk and its surrounding was home to many handicrafts, which are unique to old Damascus. Despite all of that, Damascus is also facing a large proposed development threat. I would inquire about the potential impact of the so-called Baramka Towers on the, straight, on the straight street seen at the heart of Old Damascus. As we can see here, the uh, proposed towers pose actual threat and harms to the identity and visual integrity of the streets. To conclude, 
urban interventions and conflict in world heritage sites have a negative impact on their identity, sense of place, and social connections with their communities. As such, the following questions should be considered. Should the designation criteria be revised to include identity and social values? Should the management approach for properties on the endangered list be reconsidered? How should the remaining heritage be managed in the aftermath of wars and damage to world heritage sites? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ata. Next, we're going to be having Dr. Hussam Mahdi. He's an Egyptian and British conservation architect with a PhD from Glasgow University. He was an honorary research fellow at the Macintosh School of Architecture from 1992 to 1996 and a fellow at ECROM in 1997. Um, uh, he's a conservation guest scholar at the Getty Con uh, Conservation Institute in 2017 and the senior visiting fellow at UCL Qatar in 2020. Please, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me try to share the screen. Is it working? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Noor. I would like to thank Ecomus UK Emerging Professionals for inviting me to speak. How do heritage and identity relate? I am Egyptian, so I will speak mainly about Egypt. Even if much of my essay applies to many other Arab countries, I am also British, so I will mention the UK and other European countries since I am against Brexit and believe that Britain is in Europe. And before I say any more words, I must state that uh, this is my personal opinion and it does not um, uh, represent ECOMOS UK or any, anyone else. Um, let me know if you, um, if the second slide shows, yeah? Yes, we can see it. It's Thank new. you. What is the connection between tangible cultural heritage and national identity? My aim is to challenge this idea and to make the point that tangible heritage and identity are not related, except in the sense of identity of place, not identity of people, or except if we mean intangible heritage. The first encounter between Egypt and Europe in modern times taught us the lesson that heritage could be hijacked to justify aggression and tyranny. Napoleon Bonaparte claimed to be a Muslim who came to save the Egyptians. This is a drawing kept in the French National Library expressing Napoleon's tricks during his invasion of Egypt. He used art as a tool for political propaganda and used heritage as a support to his claims. The lesson is, whoever owns the heritage owns the historic narrative. Although he was known to be quite short guy, Jerome painted him taller than the very tall domes of the cemetery of Cairo, and even taller than the local uh, on his horseback at the background. Since then, the whole Middle East has been recycling Napoleon's approach. Tyrants everywhere have been using heritage to support their claim to power and as a tangible historical proof to a skin deep constructed national identity. The British competed with the French in stealing Egyptian heritage and controlling the historic narrative. Rosetta Stone in the British Museum is evidence to that. It was stolen by the French, but when they were beaten by Nelson, they had to sign a treaty uh, of surrender with the Brits, including handing over the Egyptian heritage pieces that they have plundered. The most famous of which is Rosetta Stone. When I'm in Egypt, I go to the Egyptian Museum to see Egyptian heritage. When I'm in London, I go to the British Museum also to see Egyptian heritage. 
The Germans also have their fair share of stolen Egyptian heritage, the most famous of which is the bust of Nefertiti. It was disguised with mud so that not to show its beauty and was smuggled out of Egypt to Berlin. When I visited a few years ago, the guard prevented me from taking a photo with my mobile phone. I can see why the Egyptian government is trying to bring back Nefertiti. The sad thing though, is that there are more Europeans than Egyptians visiting the Egyptian museum in Cairo. My reasoning for that is that because Egyptians have been abused by tyrants in the name of ancient Egyptian heritage. The book by Donald Malcolm Reed suggests that the British and the French colonialism constructed a national identity for modern Egypt based on its pharaonic uh, heritage, ignoring its other heritage uh, periods. This is expressed in the way Egyptian heritage of different periods was treated and what type of museum hosted it during the colonial period. For example, a museum was designed according to the revival Islamic style with Arabic inscriptions on the facade and was named the Museum of Arab Art to house heritage objects from the Islamic period. Note the absence of Egypt and Islam in its name. So the name is Museum of Arab Art. A museum was designed according to the classical style with Greek inscriptions on the facade and named Greco-Roman Museum to house heritage objects from Greek, Ptolemaic, and Roman periods of Egypt. Note again the absence of Egypt from its name. But when it came to the museum to house objects from pharaonic period, it was designed according to European eclectic style and the inscriptions on the facade were written in Latin, a language that no Egyptian knew. The message was, this is what Egypt is about, the land of the pharaohs. Don't mind other historic periods and don't mind the current population. They know nothing. This precious heritage is excavated, kept, studied and displayed by Europeans. Hence the style of the building and the language of the inscription on it. Unlike museums of heritage of other periods, the style of the building was not the same as the style of the heritage it housed. As if all other periods of Egypt's history were not Egyptian. According to Reed, that was not a coincidence or a mistake. It followed the colonial agenda of establishing a modern secular Egyptian nation state based on its pharaonic heritage and dropping out two millennia of other periods. Uh, uh, this is evident in Egyptian sections of all European museums and also posters advertising tourism to Egypt since Thomas Cook started mass tourism by running steamboats up and down the Nile until the present. Egypt is pharaonic Egypt with a subtle touch of racism, of course. The Egyptian national movement in the early 20th century bought into the idea of a modern secular national identity based on the ancient history of Egypt, bypassing all other periods. For them, what they wanted to prove was that current Egyptians are as grand as the pharaohs uh, against what European colonizers claimed. Just like European Renaissance, the Egyptian elite decided to have a renaissance of their country by reviving its long dead pharaonic heritage. This new identity was symbolized by the statue of Nahdet Masr or the uh, Renaissance of Egypt, an Egyptian woman taking off her hijab and a sphinx rising. This statue and what it symbolized became the icon of the new Egyptian identity and the logo for all sorts of organizations. It became an icon of Egyptian patriotism and national identity. After the independence, the idea of an Egyptian national identity based on its pharaonic heritage was endorsed by the newly established state 
as expressed in uh, on its banknotes, coins, stamps, logos of universities, banks, sporting clubs, and of course the national airline Egypt Air. However, this remained a skin deep identity, or shall I say pornography of an identity that is all image and nothing else. Of course, for the layman, this was only a lip service to the government and to the pretentious intelligentsia. For him, his worldview, values, culture, and all aspects of life had nothing to do with the pharaonic Egypt, except for tourism and the income that it generates. If for the tourist dollars, Egypt is pharaonic Egypt, then Egyptians would go along with no problem. Is this identity? For tourists, perhaps yes, but for Egyptians, only while the tourists are around, maybe. If you are as old as me, you would remember an English song called Walk Like an Egyptian. I don't listen to English songs, but I know it I know it because when I came to Europe at that time, some newly made friends asked me to show them how I would walk like an Egyptian. Joking aside, this ridiculous skin deep national identity is very scary because it gives tyrants a great facade for the outside world and a pseudo historic justification for their narrative of nationhood and patriotism. And it is, of course, in order uh, to aggressively kill the, their opponents in the name of national security. Under the auspices of UNESCO and with the blessing and aid of many foreign countries, Egypt is building the biggest archaeological museum in the world, close to the Giza pyramids. And guess what? Its name? Of course, it is named the Grand Egyptian Museum not ancient Egyptian, it's Egyptian. And for those who, who criticized the pigeonholing of the heritage of different periods of Egyptian history in different museums, a new museum named the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization is built. And yes, it has a pyramid on top and another upside down pyramid at the entrance in case you have any doubt what is the real Egyptian civilization. Identity is about worldview and values, not some exotic images. During the Arab Spring in 2011, when the Iron Fist was lifted for a few days and the Egyptians could express themselves freely, nothing pharaonic was expressed in Tahrir Square. And walk like an Egyptian was reclaimed by indicating that to walk like an Egyptian is not to do a silly dance, but to walk with your head up reclaiming your dignity and freedom. None of the top 30 pharaonic gods and goddesses were prayed to in Tahrir Square. Both Muslims and Christian Egyptians prayed to the same one God and observed their values. When Muslims stood in rows to pray, the Christians and atheists formed human shield around them to protect them from the armed forces until they completed their prayers. After his coup d'etat, General Sisi made sure that no demonstrations will occur ever in Tahrir Square again. He brought a pharaonic obelisk from an archaeological site in Delta and four sphinxes from Karnak Temple in Luxor and erected them in Tahrir Square, a la Trafalgar Square. As a tourist, you would love to take a selfie in front of them, but any Egyptian who dares to get any close will be arrested lest he or she may mean harm to the heritage, i.e. the obelisk and the four sphinxes. No more Egyptians in Tahrir Square, only ancient Egyptian obelisk and four sphinxes and walk like an Egyptian returned to be a ridiculous way of walking. A happy ending to all except to the Egyptian people. Oh, uh, and you may not call it pharaonic heritage anymore. You must call it Egyptian heritage. Why? Because Pharaoh is cursed in the Quran and the Bible for prosecuting the Israelites. 
lest anyone thinks bad of ancient Egyptians, that was only one bad king called Pharaoh, not the rest of them. Oh, and now the Egyptian media is claiming that ancient Egyptians, apart from the bad Pharaoh, were Muslims. Have you not seen the painting of them prostrating in a Muslim prayer? Of course, the fact that they were praying to, a diff to different gods is only a detail. And just in case that the Egyptians managed to rise again, General Sisi has built for himself and his entourage and government a new capital city in the desert out of Cairo, surrounded by high walls and closely monitored by CCTVs. And of course, he had his obelisk. It is a glass skyscraper in the shape of pharaonic obelisk, which is going to be the tallest in Africa. So let's not speak about heritage and identity unless we mean intangible heritage. As for tangible heritage, maybe our next webinar should be titled Heritage and Tyranny. Or maybe hijacking heritage and giving a narrative of Egypt as the land of the pharaohs and of Umm Kulthum and Mo Salah as the British Museum uh, um, does. No indication of what is in between. Actually, I like Mo Salah, not really because uh, he scores or doesn't score goals. Uh, I'm not into football. But because he didn't give up his intangible heritage, he did not give up his identity, despite the fame, the wealth, and some racist and Islamophobic abuse. He prostrates to Allah when he does well. His wife wears hijab and his daughter is called Mecca after the holiest place on earth for Muslims. He is known by most Arabs as the pride of Arabs, not the pride of Egyptians or pride of Pharaohs. However, it's amazing that the media and the British public name him the Egyptian king. They portray him as a pharaoh. We know, of course, where all this comes from and where school children go to learn about history and about heritage and identity in Britain. I would like to conclude by beginning by, uh, by what I began with, the curse of coupling tangible heritage with national identity, with Napoleon Bonaparte, and leave you with this warning. Beware of any politician who brings in national identity and tangible cultural heritage discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Now we'll be moving to our uh, last but not least speaker, Dr. Caroline Sandes. She studied and worked, uh, worked as an archaeologist in Ireland, including uh, NAUTH Excavations and Discovery Program, and as a researcher for National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. That was before moving to London in 2002 to do her PhD in the Institute of Archaeology at UCL on the cons uh, conservation of archaeolo archaeological sites within post-war uh, urban development. Please, Dr. Caroline. Thank you. I'll just share my screen and get going on it. Okay, can you see that all right? Yes, okay. thank you. Right. Hang on. Okay, so I'm going to move things on a bit because um, to talk more about what happens with conflict and the post-conflict situation and cultural heritage. So what we're going to take a look, quick look at here is not so much how communities influence how their cultural heritage and identity is treated, but quite the opposite. How they seem quite powerless in reality and how their heritage may be destroyed or changed or appropriated. Um, as a, as a kind of a direct attack on their own identity. And I'm going to look at some international examples of destruction and then I'm going to look at some examples in Iraq. Um, 
As we've all noticed, deliberate attacks on cultural heritage during conflict seem to be increasing, particularly in the targeting of minority or, sp or specific communities. While this is obvious and much, much condemned internationally during hot wars, as seen with the destruction of Ukrainian heritage by Russia's invasion, though of course, how much of that's deliberate and how much that's collateral is, is debatable. Or previously with Daesh's dest destruction in Iraq and Syria, it is less obvious or at least less reported with considerable less attention paid to the happening that are happening within borders of individual states. But this, of course, is far more frequent, even ongoing, and cultural heritage destruction is arguably one of the main reasons to use to intimidate, even annihilate minority um, communities and their, her and their identity. So this destruction or appropriation comes in many forms from outright demolition to neglect to redevelopment and gentrification to appropriation and to a reordering of the narrative. Now, there are many examples of violent destruction of cultural heritage of specifically targeted communities that go on right across the planet at any one time. And whether it be attacks on indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest, um, destruction of Armenian heritage in Azerbaijan, Uyghur heritage in China or the Rohingya in Myanmar, um, when it comes to it, this just is something that is a, a constant. So when it comes to neglect and already development identification of cultural heritage of specific communities, the damage is less obvious, but can be just as insidious. Obviously, the post-conflict situation, it is, it is particularly easy to declare areas as beyond repair in need of complete redevelopment, particularly if you wish to replace resident communities for more desirable ones, however that may be defined. What I want to look at here is the way cultural heritage and its conservation can be co-opted co into this, and that ultimately the result is much the same as the overt destruction that a usually minority community is driven out or their identity is suppressed in such a way as to threaten their existence, if not in the immediate term, certainly in the long term. And for that, I'm going to look at some examples in Iraq. Um, just a quick rundown on the situation in Iraq. Iraq has experienced decades of horror and trauma, dictatorship, war, internationally imposed sanctions, occupation, civil war, Daesh, and that hovers on the edge of following Lebanon down the failed state route. The political system, Put, imposed on it following the US-led invasion and occupation of 2003 is one of shared power, the Muhasa system, which similar to Lebanon formally divides power between different religions and ethnic groups, Shia, Kurdish, Sunni, etc. Um, it's not generally popular as you can see from this. Um, the dominant form of Islam in Iraq is Shia, as with Iran, though generally speaking internationally, the overall dominant form of Islam is Sunni. So for example, Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states are predominantly Sunni. So for the most, the most powerful bloc in Iraq is the Shia endowment. The reason for telling you this is because the Mohassa system has direct impact on the cultural heritage of Iraq, in that instead of it being something of a national concern, it has become, like everything else, an arena of political contestation for power, resources, and influence. And this, generally speaking, has left state heritage institutions and organizations struggling for resources and support, and additionally at the mercy of international organizations and funders with their own particular priorities and interests. And all of the problems of heritage and identity, of trying to protect cultural heritage and of trying to protect minority heritage are therefore writ large in Iraq. Some of them due to problems we find everywhere, some of them due to, to aspects specific to Iraq. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn to three examples, all of which you most likely already know, but are reasonably representative. Abil, Citadel, Mosul, and Samara. Um, in Iraqi Kurdistan is the great citadel of Abil, continuously inhabited for about 6,000 years. Abil Citadel was placed on the tentative World Heritage List in 2010 and listed in 2014. However, prior to this, in 2006, virtually all of the residential communities were removed from the Cistel with the plan of conserving many of these, the surviving historic buildings that were in poor condition. Until Daesh disrupted things, conservation was ongoing on the Cistel itself, and it resumed in 2019 with agreements with UNESCO and other international organizations. The then head of UNESCO in Iraq chirped that Obiel Cistel would be, and I quote, a nexus for cultural industries and heritage tourism, and that the long-term goal was about finding functions for buildings that exist, he said not just conserving buildings and leaving them empty. Not only were the majority of the residents moved out from the Cistel in 2006, but in 2013, the local authorities also expropriated many of the residential properties within the historic districts of the Cistel's buffer zone. On the basis, this was the only way that they could prevent historic properties being torn down and rebuilt in such a way as to detrimentally affect the Cistel and its, list and its listing. This had the tragic effect of not only uprooting numerous families, but also of leaving fragile historic properties uninhabited and without maintenance to rapidly decay. 
The real reason for forcibly relocating people out of these areas seems not to have been about conservation per se, but in fact to redevelop these histor this historic areas, that a brand concept had been applied with the idea of developing Erbil as a tourist destination and part of this was forcing out the poorer long-term residents and businesses. There was little consultation of residents prior to any of these expropriations, but consulted afterwards, some of the members of these communities were understandably unhappy about it. They did not want to leave their homes and communities. They were not happy with the co compensation, which was for the most part, was not com commensurate with what they had lost. And they were never offered the option of staying put with support to renovate their properties themselves. To quote the author of the paper that examined this, the, the community heritage had been pulled apart to create a new brand for Abil to appeal to visitors and tourists, that in reality, the expropriation, particularly of the historic districts in the buffer zone, was more about redevelopment and gentrification for tourists um, and high wealth residents and businesses following what, was, what has been labeled as a pervasive neoliberal discourse of basically developer-led gentrification, in this case, a three billion development project by the United Arab Emirates company, Amar, launched in 2013. Since then, however, Dar has been asked with tasked with putting forward a redevelopment plan for Abil. Um, Dar is, of course, Dar al Handasha, the same company who redeveloped central Beirut after the civil war, but we're not going to go there this time. Um, from a different angle, let us now look at Mosul. The old town of Mosul is also ancient and prior to Daesh's attack and occupation, home to many different sects and ethnicities. It is predominantly Sunni, but had significant Shia, Yazidi, Christian, Turkmen and Kurdish minorities. Mosul was overrun by Daesh and between the damage, their damage and the extensive use of aerial bombardment um, by the Iraqi army to remove them, the old city was severely damaged, but not before Daesh had blown up the venerable um, Al Nuri Mosque and the famous leaning Al Hadba Minaret. Post Daesh, the old town of Mosul sat in ruins for some years with little interest in rehabilitating its historic architecture. In fact, at one point, there was a grave threat that it would be gradually all bulldozed to make way for modern development. In 2018, the old town of Mosul was, was submitted to the tentative World Heritage List and UNESCO launched their umbrella Revive the Spirit of Mosul project. Since then, many other international organizations have got involved and there are now various conservation projects ongoing. Considerable funding has come from the United Arab Emirates and to a lesser extent the EU, amongst others. In recent years, renovations have begun and things are beginning to improve. Meanwhile, focus has been on major projects to restore old Mosul's religious heritage, not least the Al-Nuri Mosque, that this had led to some complaints that there's not much point renovating the mosque, there's no support for people to return to rebuild their homes. Community consultation was carried out over a period of three years and targeted a wide range of people of various religions, sects and nationalities in Mosul, with the vast majority of respondents saying they would like Al-Nuri Mosque rebuilt as it was before 2017, but with some improvements provided the essence and main volumes are preserved, with 82% wanting the minaret rebuilt complete with its lean. In 2020, UNESCO, in consultation with the Iraqi Minister for Culture, the Sunni Endowment, and with funding from the UAE, launched an international architectural competition for Al Nuri Mosque complex to include not just the mosque and its minaret, but for a much larger complex. It was awarded in 2021 to an Egyptian architectural company whose design caused immediate and almost universal outcry and has since had to be adjusted. There were huge flaws in the competition, not least that insufficient time was given to ensure a wider range of applicants, that non-Iraqi entries should have had to have an Iraqi partner, and there were various other complaints about a lack of consultation with relevant professional Iraqi bodies and the makeup of the jury. The design was accused of not respecting Mosul's architectural styles or the heritage of the Al-Nuri Mosque and its surroundings, and the winning architectural team um, were reinventing the cultural space in their own distinctly modernist image, reminiscent of Gulf city scapes. It has been noted that decisions regarding the location and style of the rehabilitation rested not with the local community and with indeed with the Iraqis, but with the donors that, who were funding the rehabilitation, i.e. the UAE and Sunni, the Sunni endowment. And the UAE have provided something close to $50 million to date for the whole project. Um, to move on again, let's turn to Samara, one of Iraq's most famous historical cities and World Heritage sites since 2007. It is also a predominantly Sunni city, but it is 
historically important to both Sunni and Shia Muslims, containing several Shia shrines. I've been helping to write up a very interesting project that has been conducted here by an organization in Baghdad, Lihwan for Culture and Development, and funded by the International Organization for Migration, that has involved cross-community consultation as a means of finding ways to bring communities together, using the shared cultural heritage to provide space for encounter and discussion. Samara is a microcosm of many of Iraq's sectarian issues and of the way Iraq's cultural heritage has come to be incorporated into this battleground. Prior to 2003, Samara, as with much of Iraq, intercommunal strife was comparatively rare. After the US coalition invasion of 2003 and subsequent violent events, notably the 2006 and 2007 Al-Qaeda bombings of Samara's Al-Askari Mosque, which contains the shrines of two of Shia Islam's most important imams, and that's the mosque you can see with the gold dome there in the distance. Since 2007, the number of Shia residents in Samara has grown exponentially, and in July 2014, Daesh attacked the city only to be driven out by air attacks by the Iraqi army. As late as January 2022, the Iraqi army raided and killed, it, killed three Daesh insurgents in Samara. The city of Samara, although quiet, continues to suffer sectarian conflict and subsequent insecurity, which has led to a reduction in ethnic diversity. There are Christians or Kurds, there are few Christian or Kurds left in the city, for example. And a general mistrust has grown between the large Sunni population and the controlling Shia militias. Um, the Al Askari Mosque, once a shared space for Sunni and Shia alike, has been expanded and in the process demolishing historic Ottoman architecture around it. Blast walls protect the shrine, but simultaneously have closed off the historic core, killing off local Sunni owned businesses and displacing residents. The focus is increasingly on Shia pilgrimage driven tourism, and a Sunni mosque has been closed down and appropriated by the Shia endowment. Power rests with the Shia security forces, leaving many Sunnis feeling like second class citizens. What has essentially been happening is that the Shia militias have taken control of the historic center of Samara with the Al-Askari Mosque, and they forced the closure of many Sunni owned businesses and forced out Sunni residents. So what is happening is the use of heritage is being effectively split from its communities, whether it be it, whether it's being exp expropriation ostensibly for conservation and heritage, but in reality more for the sake of gentrification and tourism as in Erbil, or a kind of broader use to demonstrate greater influence and soft power as arguably the UAE financed and influenced expansion and design of the Al Nuri Mosque complex, or outright appropriation, as in the case of Samara by the Shia endowment. In all cases, there is scant regard for the actual communities and their identities and what this cultural heritage means to them. They can at best be ignored, at worst pushed out. What also comes out from work on the ground is that many people, not just tired communities, are troubled by this. Iraq, generally speaking, has always been hugely multicultural, much as, as Syria has been, and, and they're not happy about, about this um, sort of Muhasa system. From project work in Diyala, heritage of now gone communities is often looked after by, lo by a local person, not of that community. In South Iraq is a small shrine of Azir or Ezra of joint importance to both Muslims and Jews. It in recent years has quietly but persistently had its Jewish symbols and heritage removed by the Shia endowment. Community research there notes that although there are no Jews left, local people are not happy with this removal of Jewish heritage and consider considering it wrong. Surviving minority communities feel threatened and must watch as their heritage is slowly whittled away or caught between wider national, if not international polit political battles. In vulnerable conflict and post-conflict societies, this is potentially dangerous. It disrupts the process of allowing societies to recover from the trauma of conflict. It continues enforcing societal division and leads to discrimination and disruption, and given a perpetual failure to appreciate that it takes society's generations to recover from major conflict, particularly civil or interstate conflicts. This just leads the states for further, further conflict. So in reality, we need to find ways to protect and support communities and their identities, particularly minority communities and their cultural heritage in all its formats and in tandem, while at the same time encouraging an inclusive or shared approach so as not to continue fostering division. Otherwise, we are just paving the way for further cultural heritage destruction with impunity and ultimately further conflict. And I'm just going to leave you with this quote from the Balkan War Trials. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Caroline. That's right. Probably a bit fast, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all our speakers. Actually, I mean, it was very interesting talks and a lot of questions are there in, them, in my mind. So now we will open the floor for the questions to, to anyone who wants to have any questions and probably I will abuse my, my situation. I will start with the first question, actually to the three speakers. I would like to ask you about the role of heritage professionals. We complain about the ideologization of heritage, the commercialization of heritage, listing and delisting heritage. What is really the role or the agency of heritage professionals in whole the process? So I would appreciate if, I mean, if you, if you open your mic and answer, probably starting with Hussam. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh... That's a very uh, explosive kind of question, but I'll try to uh, to uh, to answer it peacefully. Uh, I think I think um, the, concern, the the heritage professional should be uh, a facilitator and coordinator uh, and be humble enough to understand the meaning and the significance and the stake of all different stakeholders and find a way of reconciliation uh, of uh, all different interests uh, while advising te technically uh, on uh, the conservation and the safeguarding of the heritage and uh, maybe speaking uh, uh, for on behalf of future generations as a stakeholder that is very important but may not have a voice except through the professional I must say, though, that uh, unfortunately, very often uh, uh, professionals uh, betray this role because uh, always decision makers need the decisions to 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 uh, to execute their plans, and uh, unfortunately, there are always people who are ready to oblige. I mean, individuals, uh, and I think that that maybe raises uh, a question of the absence of, uh, you know, some code of ethics for us. Thank you. Caroline? Mm, well, yes, I, I agree with Hassam, but I, I think, yes, it's our job to kind of um, support communities with their own heritage and to, to facilitate that and not to be imposing our ideas on them. Um, Yes. Sorry, I lost the words now. But um, yeah, because I think I think it's very I, that's, there is a balance though for that too. I mean, obviously, heritage we have to think about things in the long term, and sometimes the immediate and sometimes the more specific concerns are short term, and, and we also must learn. We also must be careful about balancing out those different time frames with with heritage. I think I think that's also very important. So, but yeah. Yeah, of course, I agree with uh, what Hussam and Caroline just said, and it depends also on how are you going to define professionals? Who are they? Are they the architects? Are they the policy makers? Are they international professionals? Are they national? What is their role? And also the level, I think there is a lack of community engagement, community empowerment, understanding of the collective values as well of the different heritage properties um, whether this property is like a, a site or a building or maybe an archaeological remain or whatever so i think it's really important to have a, a comprehensive approach to safeguarding heritage Thank you, Ata. We've got a question. Uh, sorry, Noor, go ahead. It's all right. Okay, I'll read it. So we have a question from the audience from Christina. And she says, um, how can we think of the issues of identity, 
community and heritage as a shared value in a transnational way. Shall I, shall I just uh, try to answer? I don't know what you mean by transnational way. Do you mean like by understanding the different values associated with different communities? in the same site or do you mean transnational way in terms of having like definition for the same value or the same aspect of it i don't know what what, what she means by transnational way maybe is it a global heritage i'm trying Christina. to read Sorry, Dr. Atta, I would ask yeah. her to unmute and maybe respond. Okay. So the question is clearer. Yeah, if, if okay. that is okay. Okay, Christina, can you please unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, um, hello, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I'm from Brazil. I study the relationship between heritage and dictatorship in South America, and I'm talking about global heritage. When we talk about the international heritage and its relationship with uh, community and identity heritage. I, I hope it's clear now. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's really important to understand, I think to, there is a lack of understanding two different aspects of heritage. First of all, identifying the values, uh, the process of identifying the values has been, you know, focusing on only outstanding universal values, authenticity and integrity, which are clear for professionals. Maybe as we, we discussed, maybe if we define professionals by architects, policymakers, etc. However, there has been a lack of understanding heritage in terms of its intangible value. First of all, its identity. I think today the three of us have defined identity differently. For me, I went a little bit into architectural identity, a little bit into the social value of some heritage because of my background um, as an architect and the different projects I worked in. And I think Hussam and Caroline also defined identity from different perspective, from maybe more intangible and of course some tangible issues. The other thing is, I think there is, a lack of understanding the different intangible elements and the traditions associated with that particular heritage. For example, the activities, the events, the social events, the social connections between the community and their own heritage. In addition, of course, to the limited engagement of different communities. I know that global heritage or what we mean by word heritage sites have a general understanding and all sites around the world will follow 10 criteria and they have to meet uh, two or three or three of them. I think these criteria need to be revisited and maybe they need to be redefined meaning that adding some intangible understanding to them. This is my 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 own, uh, um, of course, point of view and according to the different research and projects I've been involved in. Thank you, Ata. Our next question is coming from Cornelius. He is asking for Sam, can tangible heritage be politically hijacked for expressing people's identity, even in states that are not tyrannies? Follow on. Would you would you or would you apply these in a way to Ukraine, where tangible heritage is linked to the national identity of Ukrainian people in the current war? Uh, thank you for the question. First of all, I am against any hijacking for anybody. So I don't think that a Robin Hood a heritage Robin Hood would be a good idea. Uh, I think it's uh, once you break the rules and uh, anybody coming from the Middle East knows this, that you start breaking the rules for a good cause and then comes all the others who know, who, who do the same thing for uh, all other, all other sorts, of, uh, so, sorts of causes. So I think uh, no hijacking and I think we need to accept that so much of the heritage is shared 
and sometimes it's shared by enemies or by conflicting parties and uh, there is a need for reconciliation and there is a need for finding a common ground and uh, i think i think that this idea of of uh, treating tangible and intangible heritage totally separate and that's i think uh, embedded in the international system uh, you can see that uh, how that unesco is having two different conventions for each, uh, a convention for each and totally different system of dealing with each uh, i think this is doing so much harm because very often the meaning and significance, no matter how much we try hard with the tangible uh, to really, uh, uh, you know, uh, allocate that and respect it and, and protect it, 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 lies, it lies mainly in the intangible, it is intangible. And uh, I, think, I think it's uh, also the, the concept of, of uh, um, um, universal heritage or international uh, uh, heritage or global heritage is a bit uh, kind of like shooting ourselves in the foot because if conserving heritage is really about conserving the diversity that we have the beautiful mosaic of us humans when once we once we unify what heritage is about and how we look at it and how we value it uh, we are already damaging a lot because it's uh, i mean for example i have a a, a question to ata for example when she was uh, uh, when you were uh, analyzing the uh, the diff the problems with uh, with liverpool for example uh, or even with damascus uh, i felt that you are uh, you are analyzing it mainly from visual integrity and in my opinion this visual integrity is a, is a totally western uh, if not colonial thing that uh, did not exist really in the Arab world, uh, pre-modern. I mean, you would go in a winding alleyway and all of a sudden you find yourself in front of the Grand Mosque or the, you know, uh, and it's not about clearing everything so that you see it from two kilometers away the way you see Versailles, for example. So it's a very, it's, it's a culture specific. And the problem is that because uh, uh, so much of the, so much of the, uh, of the theory and philosophy of heritage studies are Eurocentric or rooted in in the West. We are taking these things for granted. Uh, so uh, I think there is a lot to be developed there, not only uh, not only about uh, identity, but uh, but about the whole uh, heritage studies. I'll stop here because I can talk forever. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. That's by Lily. She says, do you think there is enough policy or guidance in place to actively involve communities in heritage in times of war and peace? Um, maybe enough, there is plenty of policies, but however, these policies failed to provide applicable guidance, um, which could be applied everywhere. So I think there is a lack of particular policies for particular region. And I'm, I'm emphasizing Hussam's point that maybe for the Arab region, if we look at all the policies which have been issued, I don't know, since the convention 1972 until now we can find only four or five documents particularly for the arab world or maybe one or two documents for post-war reconstruction and they provide general guidance thank you Atta. dr samir abdul haq if you would like just to open your mic and ask your question Well, it is more a comment than a question. Uh, the parallel between Liverpool and Damascus had some sense in the beginning. Uh, however, if both cities were on the world heritage in danger, it's for quite different reasons. And in the case of Damascus, it is because war was raging in the country and there were threats 
to Damascus. Fortunately, Damascus did not suffer much directly. However, it suffered somehow indirectly because of fires, because of floodings, uh, because of overpopulation for uh, lack of um, following the rules. Anyway, those were damages caused by the war, but indirectly. Now, if we come back to the question of fire, which was explained by Atta, uh, one must, uh, on one hand, perhaps diminish the, the contour, the area shown on the map. Uh, it is the Souk uh, It uh, was victim of a fire. However, the Souk was quickly reconstructed and even one photograph shown by Hatta was a state after the reconstruction. However, one building and one building only uh, was a subject of attention. It is the uh, old Ottoman bank and it had distinctive architectural values from the 19th century and UNESCO asked for uh, special plans for that building and not to let the owners do anything but to provide plans and this was why the building construction was stopped with this metal framework. But that was just one building. All the, the other area was qu quickly reconstruction, reconstructed by owners, and I suppose with agreement of tenants. It, it was not an architectural marvel, but it is how the community reacted quickly. It was able to reconstruct quickly that souk. And uh, this, this is perhaps just a detail, perhaps it is a detail for you, but it is a significant detail. It means that when a community is unbound and allowed to react quickly, it can do, do it. And this was done in Souk La Sounier in, I would say, 90% of lots. However, one of the buildings had a distinctive architectural character, and this is where UNESCO came in. And because the whole old city is on the World Heritage List, it stopped the works and the owner was apparently not able to undertake what was asked from him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samir. It's a privilege for us, uh, for, for us, for you to attend and really thank you so much for your comment. Highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask a question now from Roger. And Roger, I'll please ask you to then clarify to what point were you referring to? He says, perhaps this is an internationally recognized code of conduct and ethics for uh, conservation professionals. Um, and there needs to be communality of political will to conserve assets. Hi, can you see me all right? Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm just uh, a, a modest conservation architect down in the southeast of England. 
um, but very frustrated. Uh, I've been involved with the Comos um, since doing my conservation postgrad thing. And um, what I find frustrating at a very parochial level really is the political goodwill. Uh, if, if your political masters want to conserve and preserve heritage, then there is a, there's more of a chance that it will be done um, at all, if not properly. That's one side of it. But the other, I suppose, um, it, it was it was spring, sprung off the previous question about um, uh, the, the 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 ethics of of um, the the, prof the conservation professionals, wasn't it? Um, maybe what we need is to firm up on uh, an international code. I know there are there are um, conventions that we all work to and everything else, but um, is it as internationally recognized as it could be? And I, th I think the other thing I've been thinking of as you've been speaking, particularly Samir, it's very interesting. Um, and also uh, from Hossam, that in a lot of cultures, the, the uh, cultural heritage is actually part of their psyche. So that the people who rebuilt the souk that you mentioned there, Samir, the people who rebuilt the souk, they understood how to rebuild it because it was part of their, their DNA, if you like. We haven't talked about places like Japan where things are repaired, but they're repaired in the respected way that is, that is um, ageless, if you like, and we don't need all this imposed rulemaking. I think that we in the West have become so sophisticated that you can't move um, before you've you know, signed loads of documents and got lots of consents and all that kind of thing. And that, and that I think holds back the conservation of cultural heritage because we're not able to just do it in a way which, which is inherent inside ourselves. I'm, I'm expressing that really badly, but I think you know what I mean. Um, because the political interference, because of money matters, because of development pressures and all that kind of thing. I think that was what, we, what was behind my, co my international code idea, perhaps misplaced. May I just comment on this? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Roger. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And maybe just to give you an example uh, is how we deal with vernacular uh, built heritage. I mean, when when we have when we have buildings that are built by the community without architects and without uh, a national code, uh, but by a tradition and word of mouth of uh, craftsmanship, knowledge, and also knowledge of the environment and the climate and the way of life, everyday life, and so on, and steps in an international expert who comes in with all these codes uh, and begins to implement exactly. uh, uh, you know stuff that is really to addressing again the point of visual integrity as if we are talking about uh, you know some kind of uh, scenery for uh, tourists to enjoy and that's so harmful when uh, when you have when you when you are dealing with living heritage because uh, uh, life is the most precious thing of this heritage and this is why again uh, the souk that samir was talking about uh, the re what was done by the people uh, is really the most uh, you know uh, uh, really heartwarming thing because it means that actually it is still alive and still despite the war despite everything so uh, uh, yeah, I think I think it is it is very difficult, and this is the dilemma that I was talking about. That we are we we are talking about uh, universal heritage or world heritage, uh, while what we aim for is to is to conserve the diversity and the authenticity and integrity that are actually were were belong to a world that was not globalized and was not uh, regulated the way it is today. And have we in the West perhaps lost that authenticity? And as you say, it's more a game of you yeah. take the debate, for instance, of the flesh of Notre Dame. We, we yeah. enable ourselves to say, shall we have a glass one? Shall we have a modern one? No, it should be exactly <laughs> what it should be. You know, and, and that, that sort of thing comes up so many times. The fire at Windsor. Shall we have a modern yeah. chapel put back? 
No, it should have been automatic for the people to have said, we know exactly how to put this back and we have the craftsmanship to do it. That's yeah. the other thing that's missing in the West, of course. We've lost the yeah. craftsmanship. The guys yeah. in the, you know, in the Arab nations, they still have people who automatically build in line because mm -hmm. that's what they do. Yeah. And they just do it every day. Yes. We've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I'm switching off. Thank you, Roger. Clara, if you'd like to go ahead. Yes, it's a very interesting comments coming through. I mean, quite a lot of it relates to two, two things. One is the intangible cultural heritage, which has been excluded from heritage conservation. Uh, and we still, lots of people don't know what it means even today. Maybe the terminology is a bit complex. Just call it, you know, people's culture would be much easier. And buildings are dealt with separately and therefore people are not part of it. People who have built it with their traditional skills and knowledge and concepts and ideas, traditions are not part of it. It's taken over by experts who go in there and take over and they engage with communities rather than involve them and listen to them. That's one big problem, so we a problem we have. Experts have taken away the agency of the communities. They become powerless, they've been shifted out. And if we want, I mean, somebody said about you know, the political will, there is no political will. Believe you me, people power is greater than political will or politics. If experts could empower people, power and people involve them, things will happen. Uh, and, and, and those two are quite, quite critical. The agency of the community, the people who you know, created those buildings have been completely lost and they become consumers and the experts become the brand. Who, who are leading. I don't like the word expert. Maybe we, sh you know, we should take that word away and call them specialist or somebody in experience in a particular area of work. Any response from our speakers? Yeah, I, I think I think part of the problem too is, is when, especially when you look at the World Heritage stuff, that, that there's no mention of community at all. There's no mention of people. It's always just purely about the physical heritage, which is very old-fashioned, really. And and this is half the problem. I mean, you see this with Erbil and with Mosul and, and even with Samara that there's no, you know, all the there's no talk of of of. It's, it's really just a physical heritage. And, and once you start divorcing it, then you end up with this situation where, where you get these developments and people are moved out and, and you lose all the intangibles that go with the buildings and go with the people who should be there. And, and I think that's the problem. I think that the, the, the people need to go back into, when we're, if we're going to be listing stuff and preserving stuff, we need to put the people back into that, if, if that makes sense. I agree, if I may comment. Uh, I think also that that should uh, also raise the issue of uh, of uh, uh, education and training because architects, archaeologists, and people who deal with material culture are not trained uh, to uh, understand people, let alone to deal with people uh, or to uh, to give them uh, the actually the, the 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 opportunity to lead and to guide and i think that's uh, that's one that's so apparent also when you look at when you find a project where people where the expert even doesn't speak the language of the people let alone understand their heritage or culture or traditions so i think uh, that also comes back not only to uh, to Western and European, as R Roger was saying, but also uh, to the way uh, education and training uh, of of architects, of archaeologists, of conservators, of uh, all the professionals or the experts who are usually uh, um, invited to 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 work on these uh, uh, um, to to conserve buildings and sites. Thank you very much. 
We've got one last question. And that's, uh, this could maybe be directed to you, uh, Car Dr. Caroline. It says, for post-conflict construction, if we think about doing it in phases, what should be pr uh, prioritized in terms of immediate response in the emergency situation? Um, it's always a hard one. I mean, I think initially, of course, you must make sure everything is shored up and not going to collapse. And, and I think the big thing is not to demolish anything unless you really have to, because there's a temptation to remove things, especially if they're politically or socially a bit uncomfortable. And, and this is usually better to hold on to that till you till you really know what you're doing with it, because you have to think about these things long term, really. Um, but yeah, it's it, there's always this balance between replacing sort of uh, communal heritage and, and then people want their houses and their. So this is one of the problems with Mosul is that people wanted to have their houses to go back to their houses. Um, and, and that that shot from Al Jazeera with the purple house in the middle, I don't know if you noticed, that was somebody who'd got sick of waiting to get support to rebuild his house and gone back in and, and redone that himself. So there has to be balance there between um, sort of sort of protecting major cultural heritage, but also sort of more specifically local cultural heritage, I think, as well. And that, has to be, that has to be balanced in. But it's very it's very complicated and it obviously depends on the situation. Well, I think now we are approaching our time. So I would like really to thank our distinguished guests from speakers and uh, other guests and this amazing audience for such a lively discussions and really kind of, I mean, exchanging of knowledge and idea. We hope this is just the beginning of further discussions about heritage and identity in our communities. In nowadays world, we are in dire need for discussions that bring us all together across any divide or boundaries we live in or we have to encounter, whether it is cultural, political, geographical, ethno-religious, ethno or professional or intellectual. We will do our best to keep Ecomos UK as a leading platform for hosting such a constructive dialogues and for sharing knowledge and expertise whenever and wherever needed. Finally, to conclude our event today, I should not forget to thank the great team that held behind the scenes to make these sessions possible. Clara, Helen, Brandy, Verity, Mariana from Ecomos Portugal, and my colleague and co-chair, Noor, for their excellent work over the past few months, really, to put everything together so we enjoy your company this evening. Thank you a lot to everyone. I hope to see you again in other Ecomos UK events, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You.